just as, as a point of information for anyone who thinks that what journalism does in these circumstances is titillate, I also helped channel um, uh, funding and aid to Facunda's family as they grappled with the worst thing that anybody could ever imagine happening to anyone. Um, uh, my coverage prompted international charities to get in touch to help with the ongoing education of the Malikzada children when they couldn't leave their homes to go to school and legal advice on how the family could get out of the country to escape the death threats that came to them daily. Afghanistan's been in conflict for more than 40 years. It's a poor, conservative, undeveloped country with many vulnerabilities that entrench the barriers women face when it comes to taking their place beside men in the leadership and governance of their country. Education is the key that will unlock the door to their participation in building a peaceful and prosperous future for all Afghans. I hope that the Trust will be able to connect and cooperate with other organisations that focus on Afghanistan so that efforts to spread education are coordinated. After all, boys and men also have to learn that the women in their lives are their equals. Rahela and Kamini will tell you in more detail what the Trust has achieved in the past 12 months and about plans for a conference in March to draw the diaspora more closely into their fold. To date, they've built and consolidated links between organisations here in the United Kingdom, in Canada and in Afghanistan, of course, to ensure that their dream of providing marginalised and vulnerable women with a stepping stone, as Kamini has said, to the lives they choose rather than the lives they're born into. The young women who benefit from the Fakunda Trust scholarships are studying for university degrees in economics, law, political science, business, languages and journalism. Learning that is the foundation of leadership. They're finding confidence in their own successes as you'll see in the videos soon to be shown. And they're learning too the importance of helping others as they themselves are being helped. Indeed, finding mutual support among other women might be the most vital lesson and it's one that we in the West took quite some time to, to learn. There is strength in supporting each other that cannot be underestimated if all women are to move forward. We must move forward together. Um, because we want to make an impact on the lives of the, the, the scholars that we're supporting right now, you know, they are aspiring to become future leaders. And you will see in the video that you know, some of them are entering the political processes. Um, for those who are development practitioners like myself, we know that we're in a 20-year anniversary of um, the UN uh, uh, SCL 1325, <laughs> you know, which is currently under review. You know, has it worked? Have the challenges been met? Um, or are we still looking at, um, you know, vocal sort of like elite platforms which are not necessarily connecting to grassroots level concerns or communities on the ground? Um, so, you know, we're in a very fluid time right now. And I think the work that the Fakunda Trust is doing is, 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 is incredibly important within that space. Um, some of our scholars, you know, they want to be, you know, working professionals. They, they are citizens who want to give back to their community and contribute. But also importantly, they, they will be seen or hope to be seen as paving the way for their sisters who can, you know, see that realizing your dreams and becoming the protagonist of your life story is possible. Um, Challenging social and cultural mores, Lynn had, had alluded to some of these in her own personal insight, um, having worked in Afghanistan, is difficult and at times it's alienating. Um, but knowing that there is support available makes the challenge easier. And I think the Fakunda Trust is trying to provide that sort of um, process that where, where we can increase the confidence of our scholars to really utilize their skills and, and, and be brave and, and know that there is support there that, that's available for them. What has indicated in the Human Rights um, Human Development Index of 2018 report, issues facing women or not uh, in Afghanistan, but also uh, the matter of, uh, uh, but also it is also a global matter. One out of three women uh, globally face violence and uh, only 23 of parliamentary women's uh, parliamentary members are women. Issues for women in higher education also uh, visible 
For example, higher education gender policy lacks implementation um, tools and uh, implementation of tools and procedures. Um, to give you one example, for uh, issues of sexual, if there are sec issues of sexual harassment or gender-based harassment, um, there are still unclarity that where these young women uh, go. And uh, over 22% of government employees are uh, women and 9% in leadership position, where if we go five years before, it was only 2% uh, the recall. So 9% is a good progress. For, for the first time, we have 13 deputy ambassadors and four uh, uh, deputy, sorry, deputy ministers and four ambassadors and many of female diplomats. So that's also kind of progress. 27 of female uh, MP in lower house, 21% in upper house, and 21% is in uh, provincial level. So there is uh, progress. Female in charities leadership are 19% and uh, in private sector needs improvement, they are two uh, percent. Progress for women in higher education has been uh, gradual and steady. Um, higher education gender policy was developed in 2012. Uh, however, uh, they faced struggle and after some resistance. But part of the big picture of development, the gender policy, uh, the higher education gender policy needs to get his uh, stronger positions and. Uh, I would imagine that there are several reasons why I'm sitting here this evening talking to you. Um, firstly, when I first heard the story about Fakunda, uh, as, as you all, I imagine, were, I was deeply moved. Um, um, moreover, much of my research over a goodly number of years has focused on gender and uh, the way that women's way of seeing is often sidelined, um, if not trampled on. Um, still, uh, uh, in the UK, um, if you look at the percentage of women directors on the boards of FTSE 100 companies, it's actually lower than the figure that Rahila quoted of um, women in leadership in Afghanistan. Um, it's 8%. This is the proportion of women in the UK who have executive board positions as against non-executive. What we normally see quoted in the media are the figures for the non-execs. Those are the women who are parachuted onto the boards, and uh, sometimes it's the same women who are doing the rounds of different companies. Which I think we'd all agree the support offered is highly inclusive. And in, in fact, in, it illustrates many of the attributes of inclusive leadership uh, and also another concept known as self-determination theory. So just a quick word on those two. I promise you this won't be an academic lecture. <laughs> Spare you that. Um, but if I start with self-determination theory, because that appeared chronologically earlier than the other in 2000 by two Americans, Ryan and Detchi, um, they talk about the need that we have as humans to be autonomous, to be in control, to be let loose to have control. Um, the need we have to acquire and demonstrate competence. And lastly, not but by no means least, the need that we have as humans to have relatedness with other people, uh, close relationships of all kinds with people. And I think that if we look at what the Fecunda Trust is doing, it's actually ticking many of those needs. It's providing the women with the opportunity to be autonomous away from their home environment, to face autonomy for the future, to develop competence, and through the immense support offered by the Trust, to have a sense of relatedness. And I think this links also with this concept of inclusive leadership, which I've personally been working on through research projects for the last three years. Um, one definition is doing things with people, not to people. And I think that, that, that sums up some of the work in the Fecunda Trust. And here's another quote, not my own, I can't take any credit for this. <laughs> creating a sense of belonging, uh, creating a sense of feeling respected, valued for who you are, um, feeling a level of supportive energy and commitment from others, enabling you to do your best. Education numbers, I think we have spoken about the challenges and the achievements, but you are all aware that this area 
is also developing in Afghanistan. We have 86 universities, more private universities are emerging, 300 institutions apart from the universities we have across the country, and more uh, students are uh, studying uh, in abroad uh, in, in the higher education sector, like um, many of them through scholarships in Central Asia, in Europe, also in the UK. The embassy was honored to receive uh, more than 16 uh, um, Afghan individuals uh, studying through achieving scholarships. That's the most prestigious uh, merit-based scholarship in the UK. And I'm glad uh, to report that m ha nearly half of them were women, female. So that's also a sign of encouraging. We have also Sumaya Haideli, one of the female cadets for the first time in Sanharts. Uh, and another one is coming uh, to, to the UK soon. So these are the sign of encouraging that Afghans um, have more opportunities to come abroad and study and go back. Already dozens, dozens of them uh, uh, went back to Afghanistan. We have, it, we have them at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and we look forward to be working very closely with Farhunda Trust. And please let us know what we can and uh, um, to help you more in, in terms of delivering uh, higher education, especially for girls and women in Afghanistan. Thank you so much. So it's important that whatever achievements that we have, that we don't personalize it and we don't say that, okay, I'm not being feminist here, but it's, it's important that we highlight the resilience, the leadership skill, the determination, and what they can do, actually. <coughs> you know, everything that I've achieved personally, everything that our organization has achieved is with the help of the women in my personal life and in my professional network, <coughs> some of whom donate their time all the way from Canada, from America, in the middle of the night, and they give advice there. So what Farhonda Trust does is amazing. Uh, and I think we need more trust like Farhonda. But we, we need to highlight that we can't delegate responsibility. I think it's pretty easy for us to say that government should do this, trust like Farhonda should do this, but we have to <coughs> seek the opportunities seek the answers within ourselves.